Welcome back, everybody. This is another episode of the Exodus Project. I'm joined by my good friend, Davon Mays, Clouds of the Torah. And we are going to continue on with the Mark of the Beast. Um, and today we are going to get into, you know, a little bit of the Pauline side of things. It's it's always about Paul, you know, worshiping images, so on and so forth. But before we get started, hit that subscribe button, give Davon and I a big thumbs up, turn on the notifications, and check the description for any literary resource you may need, his books, Rabbi Singer's books, etc. They're all down there. Please, please, please check that out. So Davon, Paul, agent of evil. Yeah, this is going to be a problem. <laughs> yeah. It's going to be a big problem. So the J-Man said he's coming soon. <clears throat> First Corinthians 7, 29. But this I say, brethren, the time is short. So <clears throat> that from now on, even those who have wives should be as though they had none. First John 2, 18, little children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. 2 Thessalonians 2 and 3, let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the fallen away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. This man is seen as the beast or the leader of the beast or government system known as the Antichrist. Some think it is Satan in the flesh, others think this person is possessed by Satan. Overall, an evil person that sets himself up in the temple of God. Well, if the time is short and those who have wives should be as though they had none, that would be implying, like, what kind of home are you going to have? If you have a wife and don't treat her as such, are sure. you, you know, um, what kind of implication is that is basically we're all about to be raptured up or Jesus is coming back. However you want to interpret, you know, mm -hmm. that scenario saying it's the last hour and yeah. the antichrist are already here that would mm -hmm. fulfill second thessalonians 2 and 3 that would mean the son the man of sin is revealed mm -hmm. so yeah, and another major understanding of first corinthians seven twenty nine would be you know separate from your wives don't even bother copulating like don't even bother making any more kids because it's over you it's know over. it's here it's the last hour time is short and if the man of sin is revealed, who was he? Because First John said there's many. So is mm -hmm. there one Antichrist? Is it a system of Antichrist? Is it the one man of sin? Is this son sure. of perdition one person? And when you read all of Thessalonians, it clearly says he's got to be when the temple is standing. Because it says he will come in, you know, in the temple and make himself, you know, like God, well, yeah. if the if if second if First John two eighteen says even now many antichrists have come, and the proof is that's how we know it's the last hour. How long yeah. is that last hour? Mm -hmm. Um, what did what did we what have we been harping on the last few videos about what the Johannine literature keeps harping against as the false teachers. We've been saying this for the last three videos, you know, Revelation, so on and so forth, is making attacks against, you know, the Pauline churches and Pauline teachings. And yep. you even quoted Irenaeus, who was, you know, supposedly a, a second generation follower of St. John, right? And even he was saying that the Western church, was which espoused the Pauline doctrines, was the enemy. So... Who are the antichrists that First John two is talking about? <laughs> it sounds like the church is telling you that a lot of these antichrists was Christians. <laughs> I mean, because they're 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 disagreeing with the doctrine, and even if it's not talking about other Christians, it's saying that the antichrist is here, and there's a lot of them. Sure. So if we I mean, throw I Paul's mean, into that mix, then he already came. Yeah. Well, look at the polemical voice of First John there. So read read Second Thessalonians two three first. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first, 
and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, one antichrist, right? Mm -hmm. And that's Paul. That's the Pauline school. Now, Joannian school here. Little children, it is the last hour, and you have heard that the antichrist, a singular figure, is coming. But even now, many antichrists have already come, and by this, we know it's the last hour. It, it sounds like a direct attack on the Pauline idea of a singular antichrist and saying, no, 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 no. That whole that whole school is the problem, just like in Revelation, mm -hmm. addressing the things that Paul Paul said in his letters. These are wrong, you know. So again, we're finding we're, we can read this as polemics back and forth. Well, another thing too is um, a lot of Christians think the falling away is something that's going to happen in our time, but this is exactly why Paul's writing so many letters because the falling away was happening because there were so many disagreements at sure. this time. And also because he hadn't come back. We see that like he hadn't come back right away. So the disciples just went back to fishing, <laughs> yeah. you know, like yeah. um, the falling away is everybody turning to all these different doctrines is why it is even brought up again. Like you said, in revelation, Paul's letters are basically uh damage control damage of the control, falling away. 100%. He's yeah. constantly talking about, I hear there's divisions among you. He's for Paul. He's for this person. He's for this person. Um, I mean, know, in half his letters, he's, he's addressing him saying like, who have you been listening to? <laughs> right. Curse. Well, if you were unified with your other Christians, us, Right. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So he's it's constantly, you know, you need to listen to us and follow our tradition. There was already a falling away because, for one, Paul doesn't even follow what Jesus taught. He makes right. up his own doctrines. How could he? he? Never met the guy. Right. So Paul is falling away because Paul doesn't follow James is why mm -hmm. James checks Paul in Acts 21. Paul yep. doesn't like Peter. He claims he checks Peter to his face. He says the disciples are so-called apostles or, you know what I mean, the so-called pillars. He doesn't have any respect for the, the the first people who were supposed to be Christians. So this falling away already happened. Mm -hmm. What's funny is he circumcises Timothy in Acts 16 out of fear of the circumcision party, knowing that he's Jewish. So he, he circumcises him because, the you know, out of fear of the circumcision party. But then he says in Galatians that he checked Peter. And Peter's a hypocrite because he was afraid of the circumcision party. Um, it, it's all a mess. And like you said, then he gets stood down by James. So it's all a mess. It's yeah. it's backbiting, uh, disunification, polemics back and forth against one another. It's no different than the 40,000 denominations that, that do nothing but talk about each other now. Yeah, you know? no different. No different. The imperial cult. The Roman emperors were thought to be gods. They set up images in the temple in Israel, Acts 12, 21 through 22. So on a set day, Herod, arrayed in royal apparel, sat on his throne and gave an oration to them. And the people kept shouting the voice of a god and not of a man. Also known as the imperial cult, it is the worship of emperors and their families as divine be uh, began with the death of Julius Caesar in 44 BCE when the Roman state declared him to be divas or divine in some parts of the empire it was acceptable to worship a living emperor but in rome itself it was not so, so that's interesting you have to die before you get deified interesting sounds that's like interesting to jesus isn't it, isn't it? <laughs> and what's funny I, I just did a paul versus paul video <clears throat> and early church father writings have a quote-unquote eyewitness of paul resurrecting and being and ascending Wow. Ain't Don't that hear that off in that church. Yeah. <laughs> Remember that second that second Jesus, that pseudo Christ thing we've talked about before? How Paul paints himself to be Jesus 2.0? He, he he basically he says, be like me, for I am like Christ. I fill in the gap for the sufferings that were says. not yet completed. So that's what he says. So uh, on the imperial cult, <clears throat> you know, um, it were it really was a, a a thing that they thought these people were gods, like we read in Acts. Like we're in the New Testament telling you the culture. So if it says if they were saying the voice of a god and not of a man, it was mm -hmm. normal, you know. And and Acts um uh was it fourteen 
where they think Paul and Barnabas are. It says the gods have come down yeah. to us. Yep. Sons of du sons of uh, Jupiter, right? Yeah. And, and, and Hermes. So it's, it's, it's mm -hmm. like, if that's how they thought, it's, it makes sense that they would make Jesus into a God and that as Rome, Roman people, they don't have a problem with God being a man. And that's how Christianity was sold to them. Sure. sure. In the Roman Empire, there was no such thing as like exclusive worship. Do you know what I mean? You could believe what you wanted to believe as long as you just brought the offerings to keep Rome running when they said to. Believe in whatever you want. We'll adapt whatever belief system we want. You know, it was it was very common for Rome to be very much like a sponge and just, like I said, absorb. If it behooved them to let you keep your religion, go ahead. Bread and circus, man. Keep them happy. Keep them entertained. We we rule. <laughs> yep. Yeah, it's pretty much what it comes down to, honestly. The way the beast is described as a governing body and has a representative to enforce and coerce people into following or worshiping, it sounds just like Paul propping up Jesus using the church. <clears throat> And the Roman authority to a Torah observant Israelite or son of Noah. <clears throat> Why do I say that? Paul uses the same language of if you don't follow his gospel, you will be cursed and shunned by the church. He does not allude to a financial consequence, but a spiritual one. Galatians right. 1 and 9, as we said before. So say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you that which ye received ye have received let him be accursed makes me wonder what he means by accursed when it's pauline doctrine that cursed is the man who hangs upon a tree is paul saying if you go against me you should get crucified too you should be <laughs> cursed and but uh, in another place he says don't curse nobody All right so we we see that it, th there's a consequence for not following jesus and the 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 beast system that we see is your your if you don't follow this beast system you will be punished you know you you're going to be um damned or you know however people say go to hell Dep depending right, on right. you know which translation you're using but basically there's a consequence for not going along with this beast and Paul says if you well, if you don't go along with us let you be cursed yep but why would you then condemn the Torah saying, well, if you don't follow the Torah, there's curses in there. Well, what's the difference between not following your school of thought? There's a consequence. Right. So he condemns the Torah for having consequences, but yet he comes with the same words of, you don't follow me, you're going to be cursed. Exactly. This you know, is Deuteronomy I, says. I don't know if you saw, I was, I was interviewed on a Christian eschatology show yesterday. Um, and it was very cool. It was actually really awesome. Uh, shout out to uh, Brian. But the uh, the it was just like some of the things I was asked. It was it was like this is just you know, to me it seemed very basic. But I, I just noticed maybe some of these people have just never heard it before. I was asked if you the way it was worded is if you take away the New Testament, why did seventy A.D. happen? Like why was the temple destroyed? And he said it sounds to me like the curses in Deuteronomy twenty eight. And I That's said, exactly yeah, why. sure. And I, <laughs> and I said, yeah, sure. The problem is, but like he was, you know, a lot of, you know, preterists and even some futurists and people that buy into the temple being destroyed for rejecting Jesus, you know, and that's why they were cursed. I said, okay, yeah, sure. Temple was destroyed in, in 70 for, you know, and the curses from Deuteronomy 28 come down upon him. I said, but the problem is most people stop reading after chapter 28 and don't read chapters 29 and 30 where it says when you're in exile and after these curses have come upon you you will return to me and you will return to my torah and i'll bring you back to the land and i'll have mercy upon you that's the part they forget to read they don't want to read that because that's because exactly it jesus because the curses the the curses and exile and desolation and so it has an atoning power Right. Mm -hmm. And when you're put in a when you're put in an environment where following the Torah is harder, that in itself has an atoning power. Absence makes the heart grow fonder, right? So you okay. return to your God and you return to the Torah, and he has mercy and brings you back. It's a consequence. And consequences are to make us better. Paul just says, you know what? If you don't listen to me, be cursed. Not like 
you know, maybe there's a consequence and, you know, you'll, you'll check yourself and then you'll be back on the right way. No, no, no. Just damn you. You know, that's not how the Torah works. It's like, I'm going to punish you because you did something wrong. But when you learn your lesson, <laughs> you get rewarded again. You know? Yeah. It's, it's, I'm glad you brought that up because the word in Hebrew for punish is onish and onish means to see that you have fallen. Yep. And that means you need to get up. Yep. So that's echoed echoed perfectly by Solomon. The righteous fall seven times and and rise. And they, and they the get back up exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so what we're basically saying is, is Paul is basically putting you in a position of he's propping up Jesus, and if you don't follow his gospel, you are cursed. But then condemns the Torah saying, oh, you know, the Torah is a curse itself. It says if you don't follow it, you're going to be cursed. Bro, mm -hmm. you got the same that, blueprint. <laughs> yep. It's you that know? fallen nature. It's that fallen nature idea that we're never going to be good enough. And no know, society nothing. has a system of that doesn't have consequences for breaking the law. Right. Like I don't think any American would want to live in an America that – goes by Pauline understanding of justice. I mean, no house, no business. Everything has, you walk into a store, there's rules. Like it, you, you, you can't have any type of orderly society without rules. It just doesn't work. Mm -hmm. I think that's a major problem. You know, Paul coming up in Tarsus, you know, having this very Greek, education and so on and so forth he really couldn't connect how the torah was more more so like israel's constitution this is how your society is to run he right. couldn't connect he couldn't make the disconnect like he was so disconnected it was like this is strictly just spiritual and religious where in reality this this is spiritual physical everything because we have an almighty god there is no dualism right there is no spiritual right. versus physical it's all interconnected, and that's the whole point of Judaism is bringing the physical into the spiritual, sanctifying these bodies and so on via what we do being, you know, um, you know, like the, the mitzvah to drink wine. Don't be a disgusting drunk, but do, you know, but it's okay <laughs> to have drink wine. Do right. it do it moderately and raise that physical thing up into the spiritual realm, you know, right. and that's that's the whole point. And he couldn't make that disconnect. No, the you know, body's corruptible, the body's damned. Yeah, he had a very negative approach to the physicality. Right. So when you when he approaches Even when the a wife, Torah, like he was just a weird dude. Yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> so when you approach when you approach the Torah as strictly just maybe this isn't the right way to put it, but it's how I'm gonna say it. When you approach it as strictly just a religious document, you get yourself in trouble. Yes. Um because it's Book of like law. I said, it's it's the constitution. It's Israel's constitution, mm -hmm. really, directly from directly from Hashem. Because even in the American Constitution, it tells you that the rights come from God. Right. That will give a right. spiritual aspect. God given rights, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So with that, if you have God given rights, there's a spiritual aspect to that. But there's still regular life that happens around that spiritual concept, the pursuit sure. of happiness. Right. That means, you know, wife, kids, family, house, business, like a regular functioning society on top of we believe in God. <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> it's it's the blueprint for the perfectly moral society. Right. You know, that's and Paul just couldn't Paul just couldn't mess with that. If there was there were a lot of theories that there was something he took issue with, you know, in his own life. <laughs> and he had like a vendetta. Right. Um, we won't get too deep into that. Even though June is almost here, so it's 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 almost that month, right? But <laughs> you know, um, so maybe we can talk about uh we can talk about Pride Month, Paul, later. But um, yeah. So it, we we don't have to beat this dead horse, but it just goes to show that Paul's Paul's lens of looking at the Torah wasn't proper. Yep. Worshiping images. Psalm one hundred six and nineteen. They made it calf and horeb and worship the molded image revelation 13 15 he was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed second corinthians 4 and 4 
whose unbelieving minds the God of this world hath blinded, lest, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Colossians 1.15, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Revelation 13.13, 13, he performs great signs so that even he even makes fire come down from the heaven and on the earth in the sight of men. Luke 9, 52 through 54, he sent messengers ahead of himself and on the way they entered the village of the Samaritans to make preparations for him, but they did not welcome him because he determined to journey to Jerusalem. When the disciples James and John saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to consume them? Mark 3 and 17, James, the son of Zebedee and John, the brother of James, to whom he gave the name Bar Barnergis, that is sons of thunder. So what do we see here? We see the worship of images, animals of, for instance, uh, they made a calf. Um, they, they worship the calf, huge punishment, right? In Exodus. Well, then they turn around and they use the same type of beast image. And then they're saying that people are going to worship this image of the beast. If not, you will be killed. Well, the image of that beast would li literally not be an actual beast, but a governmental system, but it's going to have an image. What is the image? It's something that you can see, right? An image is something you can see. So if we apply that to Jesus, it says, who is the image of God? Well, if you can see Jesus, he's an image and God is not an image. We know in Deuteronomy, it says, you saw no image. You only heard a voice. So what Christians will say is, well, it just means he represents God. He's the image of God by what he did. He was kind. He was nice. Well, God doesn't go around making contradictions and giving false prophecies and um, telling things that are basically opposite of the Torah. Like you're not going to see the, the, the kingdom doesn't come with observation. Then turn around and say, you will see the son of man coming in his glory. Well, that's a contradiction. First mm -hmm. Corinthians, or I'm sorry, Colossians 1.15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Again, Jesus can't be the image of God because God doesn't have an image. And he's created, so he can't be God. The firstborn of every creature, that would imply he was created. Again, a huge problem with whoever wrote Revelation. I don't know if they read Luke. <laughs> but it's it's pretty pretty interesting that it says that he performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. So this would be applied to the beast or the antichrist, right? But this is exactly what the disciples are said to want to do when it says, "Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to consume them?" Mm -hmm. So it's just interesting that Jesus calls these disciples of his sons of thunder well what is thunder produces lightning and lightning comes down in the sight of men which is fire why would jesus call his disciples sons of thunder and you know who is zeus the god hmm. of thunder right yep he throws lightning bolts at people if you've never seen a cartoon about zeus <laughs> yeah sure yeah in uh, so, in exodus when during Matan Torah, isn't the lightning and fire is like the same word. They're both H, right? It's fire. It's the yeah. lightning really is it's fire. It's you know yeah. um it's hot. It's energy. Yeah, yeah. Plasma. Yeah. I do believe though. I mean, quote me if I mean tell me if I'm wrong. I'm I'm not hundred percent sure, but I do believe the word for lightning is H. I never same looked up that specific word, but it's the same thing though. Which would be very, stuff. which would, <laughs> which would be very um ironic. Sons of Thunder calling down the fire, lightning, mm -hmm. you know, it all kind of ties in. Um, mm -hmm. especially if even in Hebrew it's the same word at the time, you know. I mean, excuse me, if the if the if the um the beast performs great signs, so again, it's something you can see, right? Mm -hmm. Um. And it doesn't in the sight of men in order to get them to believe. So, um, again, miracle working. This is all miracle working. So, yep. 
we know that miracles really don't mean a lot in the Tanakh because false prophets can also do miracles. So just because, uh -huh. you know, this this beast can do these signs, we know we're not supposed to, you know, bow to idols and things of that nature. So if you were to fall for that, then that's kind of on you. But again, the fact that there's an image involved and Jesus himself is an image. Yep. Why would you fall for either one of them? be it Jesus or this beast, this governmental beast. Would you mind if I switch the share for just one second? There's yeah, something sure. I want to show you that's really funny. Go ahead. <laughs> You're going to love this. <laughs> Can you see this? Mm -hmm. Fucking Jesus statue. <laughs> Talking Jesus statue. For sale online. Let's read this description. So it says, This is a mesh statue of Jesus that speaks quotes from the Gospels when touched. It will be a beautiful addition to your home or church, and the messages may inspire you or your guests with the words of the Savior. There are 74 quotes taken from the four Gospels. When a user clicks on the statue, the quote is displayed in local chat. Okay. Blah, blah, blah. I don't have to get into all that. But here's the, here's the part I thought was really funny. The inspiration. The inspiration for both this and our talking icons was a talking Buddha statue. <laughs> wow. I just find it so funny that... Uh, um, So they changed the image from Buddha to Jesus, gave it gospel quotes <clears throat> instead of Buddhist quotes. And right, right. But I, I find it so funny. Surprised. Go ahead. All these Christians all are always harping about the beast and so on, but they don't even know Revelation 13, 15. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should speak. <laughs> should speak. Now you literally have an image of the beast is, that speaks. Isn't that hilarious? Like, isn't wow. that just, you would think every Christian would like hold their little cross up to something like that. You know what I mean? Right. That's just, that's just so funny. <laughs> Well, I'm sorry to kind of sidetrack it, but I mean, isn't that isn't that funny? No, like, isn't I don't that think it's sidetracked at all because as it says in Romans that you've turned the image of God into a corruptible man. Mm -hmm. and that's exactly what whoever did that did. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just goes to show, though, people that this kind of stuff is out there. Like, it's out there for sale. Like, you can you can be put on your church tomorrow, and Jesus, a statue of Jesus, will quote the Bible to you. Like, just think about that. You know. That's crazy. Rome and their money. Matthew 21 and 12. And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all of them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves. Colubistus. Usage, a money changer who changed heathen into Jewish money for payment into the temple treasury. Why is he upset that people are doing this when it was necessary? Oh, well, don't you know, Devon, they were taking a bigger cut than they should have. I mean, it doesn't say that. <laughs> and I've heard <laughs> the different interpretations of this, but um, <clears throat> he's he's casting people out like you don't have authority to do that. Who who told you you can go in there and just start throwing up, you know, knocking over tables and stuff? Sure. For what? Because people are in there doing business. What right. what's the motivation? Doing what they're ordered by the tour to do. Yeah. Yeah. What what what's the motivation of oh I'm gonna you know set this off and go turn over these tables and you know what 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 verse in the Torah is he's you know trying to quote from and of course it says you know you turn into the my uh. The temple into a den of thieves or some something mm -hmm. to that nature. Yeah. Yep. 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 Who's in there stealing? They're just changing mm -hmm. money out. Just like if you go from Europe to the United States or vice versa, you can go and exchange your currency. Sure. And That's if I mean if stealing. you ask any if you ask any New Testament historian, almost across the board, everyone will concede that this is what got him killed. This is insurrection. Yeah, because you can't you can't go into a stock exchange or uh, any type of money exchange, currency trading, and knock over tables and just cause a bunch of problems. That's not stealing money. That's exchanging currencies. 
Yeah, try going to the airport, an international airport, and going to the money exchange machine and <laughs> busting it apart to take all the money out of it. You know what I mean? Or, or something to that effect. You know, you're going to have TSA on you real quick. Yeah, the, there's nothing There's nothing there. So, you know, roll, uh, obviously, you know, why, why is this even brought up, right? Because it says that you can't buy or sell without the beast or the number of its name. Well, obviously, if you had Jewish money, you had to change it to Roman money or they mm -hmm. wouldn't even be going through this process, which right. means that system was already in place that you needed to have the Caesar money or the, uh, the when they said, um, should we pay taxes? He said, well, whose image is on the money? Mm -hmm. Well, if you already had that in place, that means people weren't looking into the future for the beast to have its own money system. It was already being right, used. Right. Well, that's that's something else they conflate. Um, we talked about Zacchaeus before that he was a tax collector and he was ripping people off. Well, they kind of conflate that with this, but a money changer and a tax collector aren't the same thing. Not at all. I pay taxes on my house. That has nothing. I don't have to change currencies to do that. Right. It clearly says the usage is changing oh, money. Sorry. Sorry. No, you got it. Judea Copta. I found this interesting. Judea Copta coins cool. also spelled. Go ahead. I was just saying it's cool. Yeah. Judea Capta coins, also spelled Judea Capta, were a series of co commemorative coins originally issued by the Roman Emperor Vespian to celebrate the capture of Judea and the destruction of the Jewish Second Temple by his son Titus in 70 AD during the First Jewish Revolt. There are several vari variants of the coinage. The reverse of the coins may show a female seated right in the right in an attitude of mourning at the base of a palm tree with either a captive bearded male standing left with his hands bound behind his back or the standing figure of the victorious emperor or the goddess Victoria with the trophy of weapons, shields, and helmets to the left. At the bottom of some coins appear the initials SC, which stands for Senatos Consulto. By decree of the Senate, the emperor controlled gold and silver coins, and copper alloy coins were controlled by the Senate to guarantee their value. So again, the beast and its money after the temple is destroyed. This is something not so futuristic. Right after the temple was destroyed, they're already issuing coinage commemorative it says they were i was serious. just about to say like we always <laughs> see on infomercials like when something big in u.s history happens like the election of a new president or something like that they bring out a commemorative gold coin They're where do you think that type of idea came from it's when there's something pivotal in your nation's history you right. commemorate it with coinage so my question is could you buy or sell without this money since the jews have been destroyed you don't have any Jewish money anymore because you've been kicked out of your own land. If you showed up in this time with Jewish money, would it be accepted? Or would you have to use this beast money? Mm. That shows your humiliation right on the back. Could you buy or sell without this money? <laughs> Just that has the name, the mark, and the number of his name, right? It literally has his name on there. Look at it. Caesar Vespasianus. <laughs> That's his name on there. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> there it is. I mean, you see, this is this is history. This is not our interpretation. This is history showing you what they did in real time right after the destruction of the temple. They issued their own money and you couldn't buy or sell without it. Now, if you could, I stand corrected and, you know, but it doesn't seem like you would be able to if your money is Jewish money and you can't change it out anymore because the Jews have been exiled. Who's trading out your money? Right. And if you didn't have to trade out the money, why were they doing it in the first place? Mm hmm. Come to think about people. Antiochus's footsteps. Maccabees 2, 28 through 30. None of those who do... None of those who do not sacrifice shall enter their sanctuaries. And all Jews shall be subjected to a registration involving poll tax and to the status of slaves. 
Those who object to this are to be taken by force and put to death. Those who are registered are, are also to be branded on their bodies by fire with the ivy leaf symbol of Dionysus. They shall be reduced to their former limited status in order that he might not appear to be an enemy to all. He inscribed below, but if any of them prefer to join those who have been initiated into the mysteries, they shall have equal citizenship with the Alexandrians. So for those who don't know, Maccabees is in the Apocrypha. It's not an inspired book, but it is has historical value. So basically what's going on here is it says none of the Jews who do not sacrifice shall enter the, their sanctuaries. If you didn't participate in the worship of other gods, you couldn't go into your own temple. And all the Jews should be subjected to registration involving poll tax to the status of slaves. It says those who object will be put to death. So if you don't listen to the beast or the governing body at that time, because remember, the Greek beast was also in Daniel, that's right? That's number three. Yep, that's right. number three. It's the third beast, right? Those who are registered are to be branded. They're to be given a mark. Uh-huh. And what, guess what that mark is? It's the mark of a god, mm -hmm. Dionysus, or yep. Dionysus, I'm sorry. And is basically a sign or a symbol of who you are controlled by. So we see this whole system of the mark of the beast was already happening way <laughs> back in the book of Maccabees. You have the yep. mark. And you have the forced worship of this beast, because if you didn't participate in that, you couldn't worship your own God. It says none sure. of those who do not sacrifice shall enter their sanctuaries. Yep. Yeah, brilliant inclusion. I mean, it's it's um, ties all in with the mark, you know, the haragma, the stigma, all these different things we've already talked about, brands, penal tattooing, slavery brands. These are clearly, if you don't know this type of thing, you can't understand Revelation from 2023. Like the context of 2023, Revelation just seems like a mishmash of, you know, crazy end of the world garbage. But if you're living in a time that's only just right after this period, and you're reading stuff that has the exact same context, what the Greeks were doing, and let's be real, who did the Romans model their culture after? The Greeks. Right? It's called Greco-Roman. They modeled their culture. They modeled their pantheon. <laughs> they modeled their gods. They modeled their architecture. They modeled all of it after Greece. It's Greece 2.0. They just beat Greece in battle. Even in the New Testament, it says the Jew first and then the Greek. Mm -hmm. It doesn't say the Roman. Yeah, it never went away. Rome, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Greek, yeah. And here's another thing, too. Down in verse 30, it says, but if any of them prefer to join those who have been initiated into the mysteries, who loves to talk about mysteries? <laughs> Mr. Hollywood. Paul. Yeah. <laughs> so this whole mystery school did not start with Paul and his gospel. Sure. Sure. They shall have. I've heard, I've heard it citizens. said that Mithraism, the mystery of Mithraism, which is very similar to Christianity, and as far as the the rites they were doing in secret, I heard it's it was very it was like its home base was like in Tarsus. Well, it, you, now what I'm about to read is about to be crazy. They shall have it says those <laughs> if any of them prefer to join those who have been initiated into the mysteries, they shall have equal citizenship with the Alexandrians. Who was mm -hmm. a citizen of Rome? Was it Paul? Oh, yeah. Did he get that, excuse me, did he get that citizenship by being initiated into the mysteries? According to the New Testament, no, but can't know for sure. No, it doesn't say for sure, but it's ironic that that statement is right here. If mm -hmm. you join us... In our initiating to the mysteries, you will have equal citizenship with Alexandrians. In Alexandria, that's that's the hub of Greek thought at the time. I mean, there's exactly. like nowhere above Alexandria, so much so that even Philo, the father of Christian theology, Logos theology, is from Alexandria. So it's no mystery that Paul <laughs> <laughs> is, <laughs> is, is talking about mysteries. And he's a citizen. And how do you get to be a citizen? 
by being by joining those who have citizenship with Alexandrians in these in these mysteries. It just it just it's 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 just got Paul all over this verse. Yeah, and we're bringing up Antiochus. We're bringing up the Maccabean revolt and what you know the Seleucids were doing. I have a whole show on Antioch, right? Mm -hmm. um, Paul's home base, Antioch. All the messed up things that came from Antioch. That's where Antiochus's capital city was. The Christians were first called Christians in Antioch. Antioch. Acts eleven twenty six. Like this is not. You can't make this stuff up, y'all. Like just read you it. Just can't get rid. You can't get away from it. Yeah. Makes me. It makes me wonder if that's why the Reformation and so on and so forth pulled Maccabees out of the out of the canonized Christian Bible because there was just some stuff they didn't want people seeing in there. The sixteen eleven sure has it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know. The Decian persecution. A libellus, plural, libelli, in the Roman Empire was any brief document document written on individual pages as opposed to scrolls or tablets, particularly official documents issued by governmental authorities. The term libellus was, has, has particular historical significance for the libelli that were issued during the reign of Emperor Decius to citizens to certify performance of required pagan sacrifices in order to demonstrate lo loyalty to the authorities of the Roman Empire. We just read this same situation in the Maccabees. Mm -hmm. So again, the Romans are picking up on Greek lifestyle. The Decian persecution of Christians occurred in 250 AD under the Roman Emperor Decius. He had issued an edict ordering everyone in the empire except Jews who were exempted to perform a sacrifice to the Roman gods and the well-being of the emperor. The sacrifices had to be performed in the presence of a Roman magistrate and be confirmed by a signed and witnessed certificate from the magistrate. Although the text of the edict has been lost, many examples of the certificates have survived. Decius' edict was intended to act as an emperor, empire-wide loyalty oath to the new emperor whom had come to power in 249 AD, sanctified through the Roman religion. So again, this participation and this worship of the beast, you have to basically do the same things that the Greeks recommended or the Greeks enforced. You had to participate uh -huh. in the pagan system to show your loyalty. That's no different than worshiping the beast in its image in order to function in society. Sure. So yep. again, that this whole thing of when preterists say revelation already happened, what do you do with this? Right. This and is what's, all wrong. What's also striking is the, the Decian persecution. I, I think I want to say it's Pliny, maybe. I might be wrong about that. But that's one of the only times you see Christians in antiquity that there being any any on the documents on the books writings of them actually being persecuted and the issue was is they just didn't want to bring offerings to pagan gods right right um that's what it says to perform a lot of them did to the Roman a lot gods. of them did it was a very small it was a very small minority that didn't want to a lot of them did um but i'm sure the christians would say they weren't real christians right Go but something i do find now. something i do find striking is christians were not under the umbrella of judaism um because Jews were exempt, exempted. Christianity right didn't get there, that. Except Christianity Jews didn't get were that. Exempted. <laughs> Christianity didn't get that. Um, mm -hmm. So Paul says in Romans, you do whatever they tell you to do. And if you don't, you know, you're going to be in trouble. There's a problem. So right. really, those Christians who did bring those offerings were just doing what Paul told them. And the ones who were persecuted weren't listening to Paul. So maybe they weren't the real Christians. Right. And when it says that Jews were exempted, why? Because the Romans knew the Jew. We can't do nothing with these Jews. They don't want to. Yeah, fuck they these got guys. Their own culture. We ain't messing with this again. Yeah, yeah they got their <laughs> own culture. We didn't already fought them and kicked them out of their land. Like we're not doing this again. They don't. They don't rock with our our ways. They got their own ways. Like Pilate says, persecute them under your own or uh, uh, judge them under your own laws. Yep. 
I don't care. And when, just, when Justin Martyr, a church father, makes his apologies to pagans, he says, our religions are the same thing, just with different names. Like, we believe the same stuff you believe. No. You know, the devil just misconstrued it and gave people different names. So when that's the apologetics that you're getting for Christianity, it's pretty clear, like, yeah, I can do all these pagan things and just attribute it to someone else. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's not a big deal. I'm just following the rules. And the Jews didn't do that. The Jews had their laws, and the, you know, it, it, and this is this is one of the reasons that the 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 Christianity was was sold to the pagans because you could just really re you know, uh, uh replacement theology, switch it's up a couple thing. of names. Yeah, you know, it's um, it's the same thing as when Paul writes about eating meat sacrificed to idols. Right. As long as you realize the idol is nothing, you can do whatever you want. You can do whatever you want to. So how does how does that how's that any different here? Well, I'm just doing what my I'm just doing what the uh, ruling authorities are telling me to do. I'm doing what God wants me to do because they are put in charge of me for a God ordained purpose. So as long yeah. as I realize that the gods they want me to sacrifice to are really nothing, I'm in the clear. That's the Pauline message, really. And I'm I'm so glad that this even says except Jews who were exempted. Why were Jews exempted? Because they weren't Christians. Mm -hmm. And we know that they were following a whole nother doctrine to be called Christians. Right. Because there were certain things the Jews were just not going to do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the Romans knew that. Sure. By this time, I'm years, sure the Ebionite movement was already wiped out. Yeah, you know? 250 AD, this is a long time after Paul and the disciples. So after 250 years, the Romans was like, you know what? These Jews is just going to be Jews. <laughs> yeah. We're not, you know, but the Christians, the Christians, they got so many doctrines and denominations. We're going to have to tell them what to do because they don't even know what they want to do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the Great Deception. John 17, 12. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me, I, I have kept, and none of them is lost except the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Excuse me. Second Thessalonians 2 and 3. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day shall, will not come unless the fallen away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. So we talked about this in the past. So according to Jesus, the son of perdition was Judas. Because it says that the scripture is fulfilled. Yep. Mm -hmm. Paul says the man of sin has to be revealed, the son of perdition, the same name, everything. So mm -hmm. that means the Antichrist has already come. There's no one to look for. There's no Antichrist to come in Revelation if he already was fulfilled when Jesus points it to be Judas. Yep. Jesus didn't give the spiel of revelation to his disciples. Nope. He doesn't talk about a mark of the beast, any of that to the disciples. Not a word. Well, people will say, well, he gave it to John. Well, were the disciples alive in 95 when John or revelation was written? Chances are no. Because if they were already around 30 in the year 30, they didn't, people wasn't living that long, especially not all the disciples. Right. So the great deception is what? Who's deceiving who? <laughs> and then you have other sects of Christianity, you know, Gnosticism especially, who have gospels of Judas saying he was really the hero of the story. That, that Jesus revealed everything to him so that the purpose could be fulfilled, that Jesus had to die. So once again, you have the Joannine school, the Pauline school, and then the Gnostic school on its own with three completely different ideas. Yeah. Was Judas the Antichrist? Or was Judas the one who made your salvation possible? Because that's what the Gospel of Judas is purporting. There's a reason the Catholics buried that one. And we read it earlier in, in 1 John 2.18. There was many antichrists. So were there were a whole bunch of Judas, people named Judas. And who's this man of sin in Second Thessalonians? Well, when you read the whole chapter, he has to stand in the temple and declare himself God. But well, the temple was destroyed. 
Mm-hmm. So that 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 had to already have happened, right? That's right. That's right. And the New Testament can't even agree on how how my man Judas died. Right. You know, so <laughs> the great deception is who are you gonna listen to? And that's, that's why right. we we talked about this earlier in previous videos that the gospels just don't just agree on anything. I'm not gonna say on you know, anything, but on many key points, and is why it says that there are many different denominations. You have um what's the word I'm looking for? Um divisions. Mm-hmm. Jesus said he came to bring division, and Paul says there are many divisions among you. Mm-hmm. Who's who's bewitched you? Foolish right. Galatians. <laughs> right. James and Paul and Peter, they're all arguing. Mm-hmm. Why? The Jewish view. Romans 13, 6. For because of this, you also pay taxes, for they are God's ministers attending continually to this very thing. Luke 2, 1 through 2. And it came to pass in those days that they that, that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. Acts 5.37, after this man rose up Judas of Galilee in the days of the taxing and drew away many people after him, he also perished and all who obeyed him were dispersed. Matthew 22, 19, 19-20, show me the tribute money. And they brought him, brought unto him a penny. And he said unto them, whose is this image and subscri- superscription? Matthew, Matthew 21 and 12. And Jesus went into the temple and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves. So again, the the word kalubistis, 2855 in the Strong's usage, a money changer who changed heathen into Jewish money for payment into the temple treasury. I so, find this really funny that you connected these together right after talking about Judas and the son of perdition and the gospel of Judas. Mm-hmm. I've told you about the theory that Judas Iscariot in the New Testament is simply just a polemic against Judas of Galilee, right? We've spoken about that? I think we did talk about that. But For those who don't know, that. Judas of Galilee, if you read the book of Acts, he was somebody who rose up against the empire. Mm-hmm. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, he was... I guess you could say in, in a way a messianic figure, right? He rose up against the empire and was was going from town to town saying, You're not paying taxes. This isn't this isn't lawful. You know, we don't we don't belong to them, you know. Um and there have been theories, not necessarily I don't know if I espoused them or not, but Judas, you know, Yehuda, he's a Galilean that accompanies Jesus on his ministries, and his last name is most certainly not a last name, Iscariot. It means like what man of the city or something like that. <laughs> um, or if you were to put it in like Hebrew, it'd be um, um, ish sheker, which means man of falsehood. Um, so there are theories that Judas of Galilee and and throughout the whole throughout the whole New Testament, Judas Iscariot is always tied in with money, right? He's the disciples like accountant. You know, he, he holds the money for the ministry. He sells Jesus for money, right? So money, 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 money. Is all Jesus, Judas. He's told yep. to go buy the stuff for Passover. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He sells the he sells the field for money and all these different things over and over. Judas is all about money. Um, so there are theories. Like I said, I'm not I'm just letting you know what people are saying. Not necessarily that I espouse it 100%, but there are theories, especially since Judas of Galilee comes up in Acts, that Judas Iscariot is... Just like Jesus, a composite figure made as a polemic against Judas of Galilee. You know, read up on it yourself. I'm not saying this is the truth. We can't know for sure, but read up on it. See if there are, see if there are, um, see if there are some things that, you know, make it convincing, you know? Well, it's interesting that Judas of Galilee was famous before Jesus of Galilee. Mm Mm-hmm. There's movies called Jesus of Galilee, but you don't hear about Judas of Galilee. You only hear about Judas Iscariot. Nobody really talks about Judas of Galilee. Why? Because again, they tried to bury that man. He yep. was a he's a messianic figure. And guess who brings him up? A Pharisee. Yep. Gamaliel. Everybody likes named Gamaliel. Rabban Gamaliel. Mm-hmm. Right. 
So all these verses are talking about what? Money, taxes. So again, you had to pay these taxes. You had to pay tribute to Caesar. You had to pay tribute to Rome. The beast says, this is what you must do. And if you don't do it, there's a consequence. Mm -hmm. Even Matthew, Matthew and Zacchaeus were both tax collectors. They had to drop what they were doing and find salvation via Jesus. But yet Rome says tax collectors are God's ministers. Yeah. So what are they doing wrong? Yeah. Once again, Paul and Jesus, not even close to being on the same page. Right, because doesn't um, um, Paul say, you know, you pay, to, Romans 13, 6, you pay taxes because they're God's ministers. But then mm -hmm. why are the Pharisees saying, oh, Jesus is eating with tax collectors? <laughs> why did a tax collector have to meet Jesus at his house and gain salvation for all the wrong he did? What was he doing wrong if he was following? Why did Matthew have to drop his drop his um drop his livelihood and follow Jesus if being a tax collector was being a minister of God? In some translations, they call them publicans. So you might not see the word tax collector, but you will see the word publican, which is the same thing. Mm -hmm. So again, if you notice, um, in Acts five thirty seven, it says, "After this man rose up Judas of Galilee in the days of the taxing." So that means there was a messianic figure way back before Jesus was born in Luke chapter two, because that's when the tax and first was decreed. Mm -hmm. So even before Jesus, there was already messianic figures, which means when he's saying, oh, many are going to come and say that they're the Christ. Well, that's exactly what he did. He wasn't the first person to come on the scene and say right. he's Christ right. or somebody important. There was already people. And before him, it was a dude named Thuidus. And mm -hmm. they both had more disciples than Jesus did. Go back yeah. and read it. Thuidus yep. had like 400 disciples. Mm -hmm. So who was really the, the I don't want to say imposter, but uh, the mimic. Right. Jesus wasn't the first one going around saying he was anybody important. And mm -hmm. these people were actually warriors. Yeah. On top of Jesus Barabbas who was in jail with Jesus. For mm -hmm. those who don't know, Jesus was in jail with another Jesus. Read Matthew 27. <laughs> and check the cross references. I'm, I'm sorry. Check the footnotes. Some translations will only say Barabbas, but when you look at the footnote, it says many manuscripts say Jesus Barabbas or Jesus, son of the father, mm -hmm. which Barabbas means. Yep. Barabbas. Yep. So the Jewish view on the paying of the taxes and the beast, they were already under that system. Mm -hmm. And was, they weren't appreciative of it. They didn't like it. <laughs> Much less saying that they were God ordained, ordained to do it. Yeah. Right. So this is this is nothing new. And we've shown before so many Christians are already pointed pointing out that Rome was the beast that people are looking for today. Right. In fact, the entire Tanakh, what's the message of Jewish redemption, is being sovereign, right? Yeah. <laughs> a halakhic a halakhic society under their rightful king from the house of David. Not being under the oppression of other nations. That's the exact thing you need to be redeemed from. Right. Read Ezekiel 37, 15 through 28. When the nations will know when the, when my sanctuary is in their midst, then the nations will know that I'm God. Yep. And all nations will go to that house, for my house shall be a house of prayer for all nations. That's the whole point. The world is redeemed when Israel is no longer oppressed and Mashiach comes. Where is that at? We're still here talking about it, so clearly it hasn't happened yet. 666, it's just a number. Revelation 13, 14. It deceives those who live on the earth because of the signs that it is permitted to perform in the presence of the beast, telling those who live on the earth to make an image of the beast who was wounded by the sword and yet lived. Revelation 1 and, 1 and 18. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and death. Acts 15, 12. The whole assembly became silent and listened to Barnabas and Paul described all the signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. Acts 19 and 11, God was performing extraordinary miracles by Paul's hands, the beast and the false prophet. So, what's going on here? 
This beast deceives those who live on the earth because of signs that is permitted to perform in the presence of the beasts, telling those who live on the earth to make an image of the beast who was wounded by the sword and yet lived. Does the church make images of Jesus who was wounded yes. and yet lived? Uh -huh. You can argue all oh, was in the sword. It was a javelin. It's a weapon. That's all that really matters here. He was killed. <laughs> he was stabbed. And now he's saying he's alive in Revelation 18. And this is exactly who they want you to worship when we're talking yep. about the Roman beast. And if you don't worship him, you will be killed. And if you mm -hmm. don't use our money that we gave you after the temple was destroyed, what are you going to do? <laughs> and mm -hmm. we have agents and Paul is one of the agents. He's a Roman citizen. Most of Christianity follows Paul more than Jesus. And we see that sure. God was performing extraordinary miracles by Paul's hands in Acts 19 and 11. And sure. also in Acts 15, 12. So we're going to get to the 666. But the point is the actual beast was Rome. And their God or their image of the beast is Jesus who was dead and yet lives. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Emperor Jesus. <laughs> Emperor, go back and look at the videos, y'all. Um, you know, I've, I've really come to understand, you know, a lot of people wrestle with the contradictions and so on and so forth. There's a reason that the new Testament people compiled it. Because when you read these different things as polemics against one another, it makes a whole lot more sense. You know, when you start to see, you know, Revelation and the and the Joanine writings being polemics against Paul and, you know, James being against Paul and Pete, Paul being against everyone else. You know, when you start to read them in their own schoolhouse and cross-reference them with the things that are being addressed, you start to realize it's all just a back and forth battle. So there's a reason they had to compile it all together and make it look cohesive because they came to the realization this wasn't unity. This was a fight. You know, this was a battle between East and West that really never ended until Rome fell, you know, and. Um, and it's none, none of its Torah. <laughs> sure. Exactly. Exactly. Church or beast. Revelation 15, two. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire. And them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name. The beast, Romans 13, 1 through 7. The image, Jesus and Mary. The mark, the cross. The number, 666, which was Latin, Vicarius mm -hmm. Pilate Day. We showed y'all that the church father said that Latinos was equal to 666, and he called that the beast. Irenaeus. Like we just said, from that Joanine tradition. Right there. Image, mark, number of his name. Mm -hmm. Rome, Jesus, cross, Latin. Right. Like. That's, <laughs> that's two generations. That's two or three generations after Jesus, people. Like, supposed to be his, his teacher was a student of St. John, quote unquote. Right. And if he's if he's the one saying that the proto orthodoxy, the Pauline school, the Western church, the Latins, the Romans, that this is the issue, this is the beast, what they're doing is, you know, the Antichrist type idea here. Why are you why are you listening to your to your pastor instead of Irenaeus when you listen to Irenaeus on anything else? Go back and right? watch the last video. I mean, it's, it's all spelled out there. I mean, the, the beast is clearly called Latinos. Mm -hmm. We didn't. This is we didn't. We didn't make that up. I'm not giving you my opinions. Sometimes I do, but that was from a Christian commentary. That too. was from a Christian commentary, it was, right? It was a Christian commentary <laughs> quoting Irenaeus. So that's about as far away from Davon and Steve bias as possible. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> and that was a long time ago when he wrote that. So yeah. So the beast has an image, and these images are in churches today. The mark or the sign is you walk the streets of, if you walk the streets of Rome today, 
you're going to see crosses on everybody's necks. Yep. And the number of his name is the the uh the equivalent of the language that Rome speaks, which is Latin, and which mm-hmm. is on our money today in America. Never went away, y'all. And look at what Vicarious Bailey Day means. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, something that's to chew on, everybody. Something that's the last slide. Something. Okay, to chew on. so um, there was go go back to six six six. Okay, so six 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 is just a number. I think we showed in the previous video that um, it is just a number. Now it can be significant, but again, there's two different things. Yeah, some 616 man- we talked about. Yeah, some some manuscripts have 616. But 666 is just a number because we know when we read in the Tanakh, Solomon had 666 uh tons of gold brought to him every year. And yep. there was a uh a, a was it a census done and there were 666 people in a specific tribe of, of Israel. So before the New mm-hmm. Testament, this number was not an evil number. And the reason that it's on this slide is to show you that it's more of a scare tactic of the whole 666 thing because, you know, it's not really significant in, in the, the, the Tanakh's perspective. But when you apply it to the New sure. Testament, then sure. it will be significant because Paul, who, who represents Rome, which is Latin, which does equal 666, and those signs that Paul does in the name of Rome and Jesus, who is the Roman image, who was dead and now alive, according to Revelation, all these things fit the Roman Empire and their authority that Romans 13, issued by Paul, tells you mm-hmm. to obey. Right. So just to clear that up, if anybody was For wondering sure. why 666 is just a number, that's why. Mm-hmm. Yeah, especially in a time. That's another thing we're kind of disconnected from that now because our number system and our letters aren't. They're mutually exclusive now. Yeah, they're back not then, like Hebrew. Yeah, yeah, or Latin. You know, Roman numerals, right? Mm-hmm. Back then, num- your letters had a number value, and that's you know the whole point of gematria is you know these things are they work together, and you you know there's special meanings and so on and so forth. So in Latin, it was no different. You know, look at the Super Bowl. We talked about Roman numerals before. So that's another thing of contemporary context and worldview. When you see a number, you know the letters that are in that number. Do you know what I mean? Look at the money. Just, yeah. Yeah. So it's just one of those things. Yeah. Even your, even your, you know, $5 bills, $10 bills are going to have V's and X's on them. You yeah, know why? What's, what's going on here? Our our buildings downtown have X's and V's and stuff on them. I mean, look look at them. They're marked yep. in Roman literature. I mean, Roman numerals. Mm-hmm. Why is that? Mm-hmm. Because somebody still has some authority. Yep. Romans Never thirteen. <laughs> blue laws. <laughs> we talked about blue laws. Where do those come from? Like <laughs> we've showed all these we showed all this information. Like this is like not new information. We've shown all this already in the previous video. So um, the beast keeps pointing back to Rome and Greece, which is Greco Roman um, culture. Yeah. All roads lead to Rome. So, yeah. But all right, everybody. I'm Steve Eisenhower. This is the Exodus project. Dave on May's clouds of Torah. Please, please, please check out that channel. Subscribe. Turn on those notifications. Uh, what do you got on the channel coming out soon? Um, right now I think I'm doing, do I'm doing some stuff on uh, on David, um, cool. showing David as the model Messiah. Um, nice. I just finished uh, well, not just, but a, a couple weeks ago I finished the original Sin series. So check that out. Um. Yeah very exhaustive that was that was good comprehensive right on and then um 
after I do this uh this thing about uh David as the blueprint, I'm not sure exactly what I wanna what route I wanna go. I've got some books that I'm writing that I'm actually revising some books. Um because what I learned is and and I said this before that when I wrote my first books, I gave a lot of references, but I didn't spell out the scripture because I intended people to look them up, but people with the feedback, people were not looking up the scriptures. They were just, you know, reading the book. So yep. now I'm actually going to just cite the verses and explain them and basically do, I want to say do the work for them, but you know, people have a very short attention span these days, so they want everything spelled out. So yep. I'm going to do that. You know, this is what they, the feedback says I need to do. So that's, that's what I got so far on the agenda. The people what they want, brother. This is what they want. But all right, everybody. Till next time, this was the Exodus Project. We'll see you on the other side, everyone.